Hello and welcome to lecture four of advanced topics in quantum information theory. In this lecture, we're going to prove an important theorem concerning the smooth max relative entropy, which is that by regularizing the smooth max relative entropy, we obtain the ordinary quantum relative entropy. Let's start with a precise statement of the theorem. Assume that rho and sigma are density operators acting on some complex Euclidean space x, and let epsilon be any real number contained in the open interval between 0 and 1. It is then the case that if we regularize the smooth max relative entropy of rho with respect to sigma, meaning that we take the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n times the smooth max relative entropy of n copies of rho with respect to n copies of sigma, we get the ordinary quantum relative entropy of rho with respect to sigma. Naturally, we need to be precise about the smoothing, as there are multiple choices for how the smooth max relative entropy is defined, as we discussed in the previous lecture. We are going to choose trace distance smoothing, where two states are considered to be epsilon close if one half of the trace norm of their difference is at most epsilon. The factor of one half here is just a normalization, so that the distance between any two states is always a real number between 0 and 1. The theorem remains true for other notions of smoothing, including the ones based on fidelity rather than trace distance that we mentioned in the previous lecture, and that will become clear as we go through the proof. Now, you will notice that in the theorem statement, we are assuming that the model for both the smooth max relative entropy and the ordinary quantum relative entropy is a density operator, sigma tensor n on the left-hand side and sigma on the right-hand side as opposed to an arbitrary positive semi-definite operator, say q tensor n or q. The theorem is still true if we replace sigma by q for any positive semi-definite operator q, but that turns out to be a very simple corollary of the statement that's written here, and this will be explained at the very end of the lecture. For the sake of the proof, though, we will use the fact that sigma is a density operator. Before we get to the proof of the main theorem stated on the previous slide, let's first observe the following rather spectacular corollary, which is that the ordinary quantum relative entropy is monotonic with respect to the action of any channel. We do already know this to be true. It's a consequence of the joint convexity of quantum relative entropy. But proving the joint convexity of quantum relative entropy is highly non-trivial. And here we're obtaining an alternative proof that follows a very different route to the most typical way that joint convexity is proved. If you compare the proof of the monotonicity of quantum relative entropy with respect to channels that's covered in the predecessor course to this one, for instance, to the one that we will obtain from this lecture, it's not clear that one proof is the winner in terms of simplicity, but I imagine that some of you will find the proof from this lecture to be, in some sense, simpler and more appealing. Anyway, let's see how this fact is obtained as a corollary of the main theorem from the previous slide. First, let's observe that the smooth max relative entropy is monotonic with respect to the action of channels. That's not surprising, given that the non-smooth max relative entropy has this property, but we do need to verify that smoothing doesn't change this. If we start with the smooth max relative entropy of phi of rho with respect to phi of sigma, where rho and sigma are states and phi is a channel, then we see that this is at most the infimum over all states xi that are epsilon close to rho, of the max relative entropy of phi of xi with respect to phi of sigma. That's because phi of xi has to be epsilon close to phi of rho. So we're taking the infimum over a set of states that is a subset of the set we would get from looking at the definition of the smooth max relative entropy of phi of rho with respect to phi of sigma. So the infimum can't possibly get any smaller. It can only get larger or stay the same. And that step is the key to verifying this very simple fact. The rest is straightforward. The value we obtain is at most the infimum over all xi that are epsilon close to rho of the max relative entropy of xi with respect to sigma by the monotonicity of the max relative entropy with respect to channels. And that's precisely the smooth max relative entropy of rho with respect to sigma. And once we have this fact, the rest of the proof is also straightforward. By the theorem, the relative entropy of phi of rho with respect to phi of sigma is the regularized smooth max relative entropy of those two states. And we can express the n-fold tensor product of phi of rho with itself as a channel phi tensor n applied to rho tensor n, and likewise for sigma in place of rho. Applying the fact that the smooth max relative entropy is monotonic with respect to the action of channels, as we just observed, 
We see that the expression we have obtained is upper bounded by the regularized smooth max relative entropy of rho with respect to sigma, which again by the theorem is simply the relative entropy of rho with respect to sigma. And that's the proof of the corollary. In order to prove the main theorem of the lecture, we're going to need some tools, and the number one tool that we're going to use is the notion of typicality. The general notion of typicality is fundamentally important in information theory, and we used it a number of times in the Theory of Quantum Information course, for instance to prove Shannon's source coding theorem, Schumacher's theorem, and when we characterize the entanglement cost and distillable entanglement of pure states. It's also critically important in the study of channel capacities in both the classical and quantum settings. There is in fact a sense in which the notion of typicality goes hand in hand with the notion of entropy. Anyway, we're going to make use of a particular notion of typicality known as strong typicality. To define strong typicality, let's start with a little bit of notation. Let's suppose that we have an alphabet, meaning a finite and non-empty set whose elements we view as symbols. And for every string of length n, given by the symbols a1 through an, and every symbol a in our alphabet, we'll write n of a given a1 through an to denote the number of times the symbol a appears in the string a1 through an. The definition written here is just an alternative way of expressing that. And now with that notation in hand, we can define what is meant by a strongly typical string. We assume that we have a probability vector p over an alphabet sigma, a positive integer n representing the length of the strings that we're talking about, and a positive real number delta. We say that a string a1 through an is delta strongly typical with respect to the probability vector p if the inequality you see here is satisfied for every symbol a in the alphabet sigma. What the inequality expresses is that the proportion of each symbol in the string is roughly what you would expect it to be if you randomly chose the symbols independently at random according to p. Specifically, the fraction of symbols in the string that are equal to a given symbol a must be no more than p of a times delta away from the probability p of a, and that has to be true for every symbol a. The fact that we have p of a times delta on the right hand side of the inequality, as opposed to just delta say, is an aspect of the definition that happens to be convenient for technical reasons. In particular, if we have a symbol a for which p of a is very small, then our error tolerance for the frequency with which this symbol appears becomes proportionately smaller. And if p of a equals zero for some a, then a strongly typical string cannot include that symbol at all. You will sometimes find slightly different definitions for strong typicality, by the way, but this is one of the standard definitions, and it's the one that we're going to be using. One more bit of notation. The set of all delta strongly typical strings of length n with respect to a given probability vector p is denoted s sub n delta of p. We're going to make use of two facts concerning strong typicality. The first is that if you randomly choose the symbols of a string of length n independently according to a given probability vector p, then it is very likely that you'll obtain a strongly typical string, at least when n is large. More specifically, we have the inequality that you see here. The left-hand side is an expression of the probability that a string chosen at random as I just described is delta strongly typical, and the right-hand side is an expression that approaches 1 exponentially fast as n goes to infinity. So, for large n, one may say that it is extremely likely that a randomly chosen string is strongly typical. The second fact is that if we have a delta strongly typical string along with a non-negative real-valued function phi defined on our alphabet, then the inequality that you see written here is satisfied. In words, if you average the values of the function phi across the symbols that appear in a given strongly typical string, the result won't deviate too much from the average value of the function over the alphabet, according to the underlying probability vector p. Notice that the right-hand side is proportional to delta, with the constant of proportionality being the average value of the function, and in particular the right-hand side is independent of n. Both of these facts are relatively easy to prove, and we'll take a moment right now to prove them. <laughs> 
The first fact follows from Hofting's inequality together with the union bound. Pick any one symbol A for which P of A is non-zero and think about the frequency with which that one symbol appears in a randomly selected string. Formally, we can express this by defining independent random variables x1 through xn, where each one takes value 1 with probability p of a and value 0 otherwise. The probability that a randomly chosen string fails to satisfy the typicality condition for the particular symbol a is then equal to the probability that the average of the random variables x1 through xn deviates from p of a by more than p of a times delta. And by Hofting's inequality, this probability is upper bounded by twice the exponential of negative 2n times the square of the quantity p of a times delta. Then, by the union bound, an upper bound on the probability that the typicality condition is violated for any symbol is obtained by summing over all symbols for which p of a is positive. Next, let's consider the second fact, which bounds the difference between the average value of a function from symbols to non-negative real numbers over the symbols in a strongly typical string, as compared with the average value of the function with respect to the probability vector p. The proof is really quite straightforward. The average value of the function over the symbols in the string is determined by the number of times each symbol appears, and we can then apply the triangle inequality. Here, by the way, is where the assumption that phi only takes non-negative values is used. The bound doesn't hold when phi of a can take negative values. Finally, the definition of strong typicality is applied and we obtain the required bound. We're also going to need a few lemmas, and the first one is really the heart of the proof of the main theorem. Let's start by looking at the lemma in its entirety and then we'll go through it to understand what it says. It looks somewhat technical, and perhaps it is, but it is simpler than it might appear at first glance. We're given two density operators, rho and sigma, along with a real number delta in the open interval between zero and one. We assume that the image of rho is contained in the image of sigma. The main theorem is actually quite trivial when this condition does not hold, so this assumption won't limit the applicability of the lemma. What the lemma states is that there exist two positive real numbers, k and mu, that satisfy a certain condition. And that condition is that for every positive integer n, there exists a projection operator pi sub n, which acts on the n-fold tensor product of whatever space rho and sigma act on, such that the three conditions listed here are true. The first condition is that pi sub n commutes with sigma tensor n. The second condition is that the inner product of pi sub n with rho tensor n is at least 1 minus k times the exponential of negative mu times n. And the third property is the inequality that you see written here. This inequality does have a simple interpretation. It says, in essence, when combined with the assumption that pi sub n commutes with sigma tensor n, that you can take pi sub n to be the projection onto the space spanned by some subset of the eigenvectors of sigma tensor n, for which the corresponding eigenvalues lie between the two values appearing in the inequality, 2 to the 1 plus delta times n times the trace of rho log sigma, and 2 to the 1 minus delta times n times the trace of rho log sigma. It is important to note that k and mu are positive real numbers that can depend on rho and sigma but they're independent of the integer n. In particular, the value on the right-hand side of the second item approaches one, exponentially fast in fact, as n goes to infinity. Now let's see how the lemma is proved. First, choose any spectral decomposition of sigma and let the non-zero eigenvalues of sigma be indexed by an alphabet capital sigma. You can take this alphabet to be the integers from one to k, for k being the rank of sigma, but it's not important what the symbols are. There's no need to include the zero eigenvalues in this expression of sigma, meaning that we can assume q of a is positive for every symbol a, but this isn't really important. It wouldn't make any difference if we did include the zero eigenvalues, but for simplicity, we won't. Next, let's define a probability vector p over the alphabet sigma by taking p of a to be equal to x sub a star times rho times x sub a. That is, if we express rho as a matrix, not in the standard basis, but in the basis of eigenvectors of sigma, 
then the vector P would be given by the diagonal entries of this matrix. The fact that P is a probability vector follows from the assumption that the image of rho is contained in the image of sigma, so we're not missing out on any non-zero parts of rho by restricting our attention to the non-zero eigenvalues of sigma. At this point, we can explicitly define pi sub n for every positive integer n. It's simply the projection onto the eigenspaces of sigma tensor n that correspond to strongly typical strings with respect to the probability vector p as is written here. The fact that it is the probability vector p as opposed to q, say, that gives pi sub n a dependence on the state rho, and this dependence is essential. Now, we just need to verify that pi sub n satisfies the three properties we require of it. And we can see quite immediately that the first property is satisfied, as sigma tensor n and pi sub n share a common basis of eigenvectors, namely the basis we get by tensoring together n eigenvectors of sigma in all possible combinations. So the first property is always satisfied. Now for the second property, we'll use the first of the two facts we observed previously concerning strong typicality. That is, the inner product of pi sub n with rho tensor n evaluates directly to the expression that you see here, which is none other than the probability that a string whose symbols are chosen independently according to the probability vector p is strongly typical. If we take the bound we observed previously, which is precisely the first of the two facts concerning strong typicality just alluded to, we obtain the lower bound that you see here. And we can lower bound this quantity as one minus k times the exponential of negative mu times n by selecting k and mu in the perhaps obvious way that's written here. As is necessary, k and mu do depend on rho and sigma, and that dependence is reflected by their dependence on p but they are independent of n. So the second property required of pi sub n has been verified. Moving on to the third and final property we require of pi sub n, it will probably not be surprising that we'll use the second fact concerning strong typicality that we noted previously. Specifically, let's define a function phi from the alphabet sigma to the non-negative real numbers by letting phi of a be the negative logarithm of q of a for every a in sigma. q of a is a probability, so this function indeed takes non-negative values. And if we look at the mean value of this function with respect to the probability vector p, we see that it's the negative trace of rho log sigma. That can be verified by thinking about the trace of rho log sigma in terms of the basis of eigenvectors of the state sigma. Now let's consider the inequality that we know must be true for every strongly typical string, which is shown here. This is exactly the second fact concerning strong typicality from before. Now plug in the choice for the function phi we just made, phi of a equals the negative logarithm of q of a, as well as the expression we just observed for the mean value of this function, and here's what we get. If we now multiply through by n and exponentiate, we can express the inequality as you see here. The two inequalities result from thinking about the two possibilities that what's inside of the absolute value takes either a positive or a negative value. And at this point, we have exactly what we need. The eigenvalues of sigma tensor n that are effectively picked out by pi sub n are given by the products q of a1 through q of a n ranging over all the strongly typical strings a1 through a n. I'll leave that on the screen for just a moment, and you can pause the video in case you'd like to stare at it for a bit. Having verified these three required properties of the projection pi sub n, we've proved the lemma. Now, the lemma we just proved is pretty interesting, and as I stated, it really is at the heart of the proof of the main theorem. We're also going to need a lemma that's kind of boring. It's intuitive, but not obvious, but fortunately, it isn't too hard to prove. Anyway, here's the lemma. Suppose that we have a density operator rho 
a positive real number epsilon, and two projection operators, pi and delta, and assume that the inner product of pi with rho and the inner product of delta with rho are both at least one minus epsilon. What the lemma states is that the inner product of the operator delta times pi times delta with rho must be at least one minus six times epsilon. Intuitively speaking, you can imagine two separate measurements, one having pi as a measurement operator and the other having delta as a measurement operator. Measuring with respect to either of the measurements is very likely to yield the outcome corresponding to pi or delta, under the assumption that epsilon is small. The way you can think about the inner product of delta times pi times delta with rho is that it represents the probability that if you first measure rho with respect to the second measurement, the one that has delta as one of its measurement operators, and then you measure with respect to the first measurement, which has pi as one of its measurement operators, then you're pretty likely to obtain the outcome corresponding to delta for the first measurement and the outcome corresponding to pi for the second measurement. Now let's prove the lemma. The first step of the proof is to consider the value we're trying to bound and to write it as the trace of pi times delta times rho times delta times pi. Here we're using the fact that pi is a projection, so pi squared equals pi, along with the cyclic property of the trace. This quantity can alternatively be written as the two norms squared of pi times delta times the square root of rho. By the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, this value is at least as large as the inner product written here, keeping in mind that the two norm of the square root of rho must equal one because rho is a density operator. By shuffling things around a bit, that inner product can alternatively be expressed as the absolute value squared of the inner product of delta times pi with rho. We're going to need this inequality in just a moment, but first let's observe a simple equality, which is that the identity minus delta times the identity minus pi plus delta plus pi minus delta times pi is simply the identity operator. If we now consider the inner product of the two sides of this equality with rho, we obtain the equality written here. And shuffling it around a bit yields this equality. The inner product of delta times pi with rho is equal to the inner product of delta with rho plus the inner product of pi with rho minus one plus the inner product of the identity minus delta times the identity minus pi with rho. Now, it looks like we might be just trying to entertain ourselves with operator equalities, but this kind of thing is actually quite common when proving operator inequalities. Sometimes you just have to guess the right forms through which they can be approached. Anyway, we can now apply the triangle inequality to this equality, and we find that the absolute value of the inner product of delta times pi with rho is at least the difference between the two absolute values written here. That's not the most common form of the triangle inequality, but if you move the rightmost term to the left-hand side of the inequality, then you may more easily recognize this as the triangle inequality. Now, the first term on the right-hand side is at least one minus two times epsilon, and that follows from our assumptions that the inner product of delta with rho and the inner product of pi with rho are both at least one minus epsilon. The second term can be bounded using Cauchy-Schwarz in the manner that you see here, once again using our assumption that the inner product of both pi and delta with rho is at least 1 minus epsilon. We therefore find that the absolute value of the inner product of delta times pi with rho is at least 1 minus 3 times epsilon. And if we now combine this with the first inequality we proved, we get the result. We could add 9 epsilon squared to this bound, but that won't be worth the bits required to put it on the slide. A simple expression is better. By the way, if we happen to have that delta commutes with rho, then we can improve the bound to 1 minus 2 times epsilon, but that bound doesn't hold in general. The final lemma we require before we get on to the proof of the main theorem is a very well-known and very useful lemma known as Winter's Gentle Measurement Lemma. That's winter the person, not the season. It still sounds kind of poetic, though. Anyway, suppose that pi is a projection operator and rho is a density operator, and assume that the inner product of pi with rho is non-zero, 
If we then consider the fidelity between rho and the state you get by normalizing rho conjugated by pi, we find that this fidelity actually has a closed form expression. It's simply the square root of the inner product of pi with rho. That's quite easy to check. We don't need Ullman's theorem or any other alternative characterizations of the fidelity. It follows quite directly from the definition of the fidelity. One way to interpret this in intuitive terms is to imagine that the inner product of pi with rho is large, close to one, let's say, and to think about the state you would obtain by performing a non-destructive measurement on rho, where one of the measurement operators is pi, and conditioned on having obtained the result corresponding to pi, you'll be left with a state that's very close to rho. So the measurement was gentle with rho and didn't change it very much. There is a more general form of this lemma, which works for any measurement operator and not just a projection. And in this case, we have an inequality rather than an equality, as you see here. We won't need the more general form, but that is typically the statement known as Winter's gentle measurement lemma. It just happens to simplify a bit when we have a projection operator. Let us also note that we can combine either statement with one of the Fuchs van der Graaff inequalities to obtain a bound on the trace distance between the two states. Here I've written the bound for the case when we have a projection operator because that's the one we're going to need, but naturally you can get a similar bound for the more general case. Finally, we're ready to prove the main theorem. So let's put the statement of the theorem on the top of the slide so that we can remember what we're trying to prove. As mentioned previously, the theorem is completely trivial in the case when the image of rho is not contained in the image of sigma, as both expressions in the equation become positive infinity in that case. So we'll assume throughout the proof that the image of rho is contained in the image of sigma. Let's also take delta to be an arbitrarily chosen positive real number. And the fact that delta is arbitrary will be exploited later, as it could be as small as we need it to be. The first thing we'll do is to apply the key lemma, meaning the first one that we proved. And this lemma implies that for every positive integer n, there exists a projection operator pi sub n satisfying the three properties that are listed here. k and mu, as you will recall, are positive real numbers that can depend on rho and sigma, but not on n. We can also apply our lemma a second time, but this time rather than applying it to rho and sigma, we'll apply it to rho and rho again. Of course, we are free to apply the lemma to two copies of rho as opposed to rho and sigma. We obtain a projection operator that we'll call delta sub n for each positive integer n, and three similar properties have to be satisfied by these projections, where naturally every instance of sigma is replaced by rho. Two points about these three properties. One is that we have written negative one times the entropy of rho in place of the trace of rho log rho. That's simple enough. The second is that technically it may not be the same values of k and mu that emerge from the lemma when we replace sigma by rho. But there's no loss of generality in taking these values to be the same for the two applications of the lemma, as we can always simply take the maximum of the two values of k and the minimum of the two values of mu, just so that our notation doesn't become overly cluttered. Now, the proof will be broken down into two main parts. First, we'll prove that the regularization of the smooth max relative entropy is at most a quantum relative entropy, and then we'll prove the reverse inequality. In other words, we'll first prove that the left-hand side of the equation is at most the right-hand side, and then we'll prove that the left-hand side is at least the right-hand side, and that will give us the equality we require. To prove that the regularized smooth max relative entropy is upper bounded by the ordinary quantum relative entropy, we need to show that the smooth max relative entropy isn't too large. So we're trying to prove that smoothing makes the max relative entropy small enough to get the inequality we need. So the approach we'll take is the natural one. We'll do our best to find a state that's close to rho tensor n that has small max relative entropy with respect to sigma tensor n. And the state that we'll choose for each choice of n is the state xi sub n you see here. We conjugate rho tensor n with the projection delta sub n, and then we conjugate again by pi sub n and then normalize the resulting operator. Here's an example, by the way, where we could have saved a little bit of trouble if we allowed ourselves to smooth to subnormalized states rather than forcing ourselves to smooth to a normalized state. But it isn't really a major complication to normalize. Our first order of business with respect to the state is to prove that it is indeed close to rho tensor n, at least when n is large. 
And we can do this using Winter's gentle measurement lemma. I should mention perhaps that it is possible to directly obtain an expression for the fidelity of xi sub n with rho tensor n, and to argue that the value goes to one in the limit as n goes to infinity. But for that, we need to know more involved things about the fidelity, whereas the approach using Winter's gentle measurement lemma is perhaps more intuitive and easier to describe. Anyway, let's consider the trace distance between xi sub n and rho tensor n and use the triangle inequality to bound this quantity by the sum of the trace distances between the two terms you see here. The first being the trace distance between xi sub n and tau sub n, and the second being the trace distance between tau sub n and rho tensor n, where tau sub n is the state you get by conjugating rho tensor n just by delta sub n and normalizing. It will be convenient in a moment that we note at this point that xi sub n is what we obtain by conjugating tau sub n with pi sub n and then normalizing. An easy way to see that is just to check that the numerator is correct and to observe that both states are properly normalized. To upper bound the first term, we can make use of the relationship between xi sub n and tau sub n that we just noted and then apply Winter's gentle measurement lemma to obtain the upper bound square root of one minus the inner product of pi sub n with tau sub n. By substituting the definition of tau sub n, we can express the inner product of pi sub n with tau sub n as the ratio of inner products you see here. And because we'd like a lower bound in this value, we may as well just throw away the denominator because the denominator is at most one. And we find that the inner product of pi sub n with tau sub n is at least as large as the inner product of delta sub n, pi sub n, delta sub n with rho tensor n. And this is where the boring lemma comes in. We know from the key lemma that the inner product of pi sub n with rho tensor n and the inner product of delta sub n with rho tensor n are both at least one minus k times the exponential of negative mu times n. So the inner product of delta sub n, pi sub n, delta sub n with rho tensor n is at least one minus six times k times the exponential of negative mu times n, and so we obtain the upper bound that you see here. I do realize, by the way, that it might be hard to keep in your memory all the various lemmas and bounds that we need. And if you don't manage to absorb this all in a single viewing, it's okay. You're not expected to get this in one shot. It's all a bit technical. Don't be afraid to hit the pause button, go back when it's helpful, and don't worry if it's not crystal clear the first time through. Anyway, that is the bound we get. And the key here is that our upper bound goes to zero exponentially quickly as it happens, as n goes to infinity. That means regardless of how small epsilon was, and remember that epsilon is a given real number in the open interval between zero and one, we find that the trace distance between xi sub n and tau sub n must be smaller than half of epsilon for all but finitely many choices of n. We're comparing the trace distance between xi sub n and tau sub n with half of epsilon, by the way, as opposed to just epsilon, because we still have the second term to worry about. And what we really need is for the trace distance between xi sub n and rho tensor n to be at most epsilon. Speaking of the second term, we can bound this one in a very similar way to the first, although this time we don't actually need the boring lemma and no factor of six appears. We get directly from the key lemma that the inner product of delta sub n with rho tensor n is at least one minus k times the exponential of negative mu times n. And again, we find that the trace distance is at most one half of epsilon for all but finitely many n. Summing the two terms, we find that xi sub n has trace distance at most epsilon from rho tensor n, or in other words, xi sub n is contained in b sub epsilon of rho tensor n. Consequently, the smooth max relative entropy of rho tensor n with respect to sigma tensor n is no larger than the max relative entropy of xi sub n with respect to sigma tensor n. And so now we just need to upper bound this max relative entropy. Here's the definition of xi sub n again, and recall that we obtained four operator inequalities from our key lemma. We'll use all four eventually, but right now we're just going to use two of them. By the last one, we get the inequality shown here by conjugating by pi sub n. And the right-hand side can be upper bounded by two to the negative one minus delta times n times the entropy of rho, multiplied by the projection pi sub n. 
by observing that delta sub n is, like all projections, less than or equal to the identity operator. We can also use the first of the four inequalities from the key lemma to obtain the upper bound shown here on the projection pi sub n. And given that pi sub n commutes with sigma tensor n, that operator is upper bounded by two to the negative one plus delta times n times the trace of rho log sigma multiplied to the operator sigma tensor n. And when we combine the two inequalities, we obtain a somewhat complicated looking operator inequality, but it does simplify a bit and the point is that this operator inequality has the form we need to upper bound the max relative entropy of psi sub n with respect to sigma tensor n. Specifically, this max relative entropy is at most n times the ordinary relative entropy of rho with respect to sigma, plus delta times n times the entropy of rho minus the trace of rho log sigma minus the log of one minus six times the exponential of negative mu times n. That last term is coming from the normalization of xi sub n, along with the fact that we have a bound on that normalization factor, which we already saw before, again coming from the key lemma. Dividing by n and taking the limit gives the much simpler looking upper bound that you see here, which is the relative entropy of rho with respect to sigma plus delta times the entropy of rho minus the trace of rho log sigma. But keeping in mind that delta is arbitrarily small, we conclude that the regularization of the smooth max relative entropy is upper bounded by the ordinary quantum relative entropy of rho with respect to sigma. So that's great, we're halfway there. We just need to prove the reverse inequality now. In order to prove this bound, we'll make use of our conic program for the smooth max relative entropy, specifically the smooth max relative entropy of rho tensor n with respect to sigma tensor n is the logarithm of the optimal value of this conic program, which we obtained in the previous lecture. What we're going to do is we're going to use the dual problem to prove a lower bound on the smooth max relative entropy in order to obtain the required bound after dividing by n and taking the limit. So once again, let delta be an arbitrarily chosen positive real number. And as you might expect, we're going to utilize the fact that this number can be taken to be arbitrarily small near the end of the proof, just like we did before. But for now, delta is just a positive real number. And here is the operator z sub n that we'll choose for each positive integer n as a dual solution to our conic program. Naturally, we need to prove that z sub n is dual feasible, and we need to see what its corresponding objective value is. Let's begin with its feasibility. Going back to the four operator inequalities we obtained from the key lemma, we'll use this one, the upper bound on sigma tensor n conjugated by pi. Like I said before, we're gonna need all four of these for the proof. This one allows us to obtain an upper bound on the inner product of sigma tensor n with the operator pi sub n delta sub n pi sub n, as is written here. There's just one operator inequality left, and it's the one right here. And we need this one to upper bound the inner product between delta sub n and pi sub n, like we have here. In the very last inequality that's written here, by the way, we're using the fact that the inner product of rho tensor n conjugated by delta sub n with pi sub n is at most one. That's simply because rho tensor n is a density operator and delta sub n and pi sub n are projections. So this is an inner product between a subnormalized density operator and a projection operator. Putting together the two bounds, we obtain this upper bound on the inner product of sigma tensor n with the operator pi sub n delta sub n pi sub n. And now it's evident why we selected z sub n in the way that we did, or at least why the leading constant is chosen as it is. For now we have that this inner product of sigma tensor n with z sub n is at most one, and therefore z sub n is dual feasible. Now let's see what we can say about the objective value achieved by z sub n. Plugging z sub n into the objective function yields the expression you see here. And getting a bound on the infimum is actually a piece of cake. The inner product between the difference of rho tensor n and xi and the operator pi sub n delta sub n pi sub n is at most the trace distance between the two states. And that's because pi sub n delta sub n pi sub n is positive semi-definite and at most the identity.
you would actually achieve the trace distance by maximizing the inner product over all such operators. And because xi is epsilon close to rho tensor n, this value is at most epsilon. It follows that the infimum in the objective function is at least the inner product of rho tensor n with the operator pi sub n delta sub n pi sub n minus epsilon. And we can make use of the same lower bound on the inner product that we've used a couple of times already. The point is that this lower bound approaches one minus epsilon in the limit as n goes to infinity. And because epsilon is assumed to be a constant in the open interval between zero and one, this is a strictly positive number, meaning that it's bounded away from zero. Thus, taking the logarithm of the objective value yields the lower bound that you see here. Then when we divide by n and take the limit, we get the lower bound shown here. As before, because this bound holds for all delta greater than zero, we obtain the bound we need, and the proof is complete. That wasn't exactly the simplest of proofs. There were a lot of technical details in there, but we didn't sweep anything under the rug, and given that the theorem implies the monotonicity of quantum relative entropy under the action of channels, we probably shouldn't have expected a simple proof. One final remark, the theorem still holds when sigma is replaced by an arbitrary positive semidefinite operator Q, as mentioned earlier in the lecture. We did use the fact that sigma is a density operator in the proof, in the key lemma specifically, but given that the theorem holds for density operator models, we can conclude that it holds for positive semidefinite operator models simply by rescaling everything. In particular, suppose Q is any non-zero positive semidefinite operator, and let sigma be the density operator that's proportional to Q. You can verify that the smooth max relative entropy of rho tensor n with respect to Q tensor n is simply the smooth max relative entropy of rho tensor n with respect to sigma tensor n minus n times the log of the trace of Q. Applying the theorem, we find that the regularized smooth max relative entropy of rho with respect to Q is equal to the quantum relative entropy of rho with respect to sigma minus the log of the trace of Q. And that's just the quantum relative entropy of rho with respect to Q. In a nutshell, the max relative entropy, the smooth max relative entropy, and the ordinary relative entropy all behave the same way with respect to rescaling the model. And that's one more lecture in the bag. As always, feel free to ask questions if you have them.